day and welcome to today's webinar on Gulf Aviation Outlook and Trends. First, let me introduce myself. My name is Paul Brangan. I am Director of Communications and External Affairs at the Pacific Asia Travel Association, otherwise known as PADA. Today, we'll be looking at uh, current, uh, current trends and outlook in the, in the Gulf region with our good friends at the International Air Transport Association, otherwise known as IATA. Uh, they will be, he'll be joined afterwards by PADA CEO, Dr. Mara Hardy for a one-on-one -on -one interview regarding some of the things we've seen in today's presentation. And with that, I'd like to welcome with us the direct, Regional Director of Africa and the Middle East for Airports, Passenger, Cargo, Security, and Facilitation at IATA. Please welcome Mr. Kashif Kali. Kashif? Hello, good day, Paul. And on behalf of IATA, I wanted to thank Pata for the invitation. What I would like to do is just provide a very quick overview of how IATA views the industry, spe especially in the Gulf region and in the Middle East, and the impact it's having on not only aviation, but associated industries, and how the pandemic has really uh, brought the industry to a standstill. So if we look at uh, the Africa and the Middle East region, which is the one that, that uh, I, I look after, we're, we're a, having multiple challenges as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. And the three big ticket items that we have are border control measures or uh, border suspensions, followed by quarantine and then testing policy. And what we can still see in, in the Africa and the Middle East region, specifically the Middle East, that most of the borders remain partially restrictive. We, we all know early on when the onslaught of COVID-19 began, towards the end of January, February, governments started shutting their borders, putting in additional measures and restrictions on passengers that had been in specific parts of the world. And as the pandemic evolved, so did the border control measures across the region. And the Middle East is no different from that. Uh, we had border borders that were shut, international flights that were restricted. And just to give the audience a perspective, between March and April, we had nearly 95% of all activities shut for, for air travel in the Middle East region. And towards July, we saw uh, borders and, and uh, public health measures being introduced for, towards the gradual reopening of borders. But it's still not a, um, you know, a, a very a promising picture because we still see variations from countries that are totally restrictive to partially restrictive, and some countries that have put in a range of additional measures for the entry of passengers. And we'll talk a little bit about that. So as I mentioned, the three big ticket items for IATA in the Middle East and the Gulf region are border control measures, quarantine, and testing. And for the large part, most of the Gulf countries um, are, are partially restrictive. So that means that citizens and residents can travel freely. Um, other than that, international tourism in certain parts of the Gulf region is allowed. Sometimes you need uh, prior approval with others uh, still remaining closed for tourism, uh, unfortunately. If we look at quarantine measures in the AME region or the Middle East specifically, we still have governments in, uh, mandating an institutional quarantine. For the large part, we're pleased to see that um, many governments have, have listened to the call put out by IATA as well as the aviation industry to take a pragmatic approach towards quarantine. What we've noticed is that any government that has an institutional quarantine policy, it's as good as keeping borders closed. Um, but within the region, we have approximately 29 countries out of roughly 69 that have some form of a quarantine policy. In the Gulf region, I'm pleased to say that most of the governments take a uh, pragmatic approach towards quarantine, and it's only administered um, uh, if, if you are uh, tested positive or if, if you're showing symptoms until you get a negative uh, PCR result. But other than that, there's, uh, we, we firmly believe that quarantine remains a deterrent to uh, restarting aviation uh, activity, shall we say. If we look at testing within the region, it's no surprise, like with many other regions, the Middle East and the Gulf has a uh, testing policy. So what we see is 
the industry has settled upon currently PCR as the recognized standard. Many governments request passengers to carry a COVID negative uh, uh, certificate, uh, typically 96 to 120 hours before departure. And some governments have now started uh, conducting uh, secondary tests on arrival as well. So in the case of, for example, Jordan, um, which, which is where IATA's regional office is based, you're requested to have a PCR test uh, up to 120 hours before departure, but you do also have to get a secondary test upon arrival. And what that does is uh, it's, it's a government policy that helps um, the government at least open up aviation. Jordan was one of the countries that had kept aviation closed since March up until a couple of weeks ago. But interestingly, in the Gulf region, specifically Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain and Oman, uh, have varying policies when it comes to testing. All uh, countries in the Gulf region do require passengers to carry negative PCR tests. But uh, in the case of uh, Dubai, uh, more recently, uh, the testing policy was uh, revised to have two sets of rules, one from passengers, one for passengers coming in from uh, countries with a lower risk disposition versus um, the latter or, or the other. And the degree to which you get tested depends upon which uh, country you're originating from. And what that means is you could be subjected to a uh, a double testing regime or just carry a negative PCR and you're able to uh, enter uh, the United Arab Emirates. But Dubai is one of those countries that was the early, um, let's say, adopter of, of health measures stipulated by uh, ICAO as well as IATA. And they opened up tourism uh, um, earlier than most of the other regional uh, Gulf countries did. So early July, Dubai opened up uh, and reinstated their visa policy. And we've seen traffic uh, increasing significantly for the UAE. One of the things that IATA has been tracking um, throughout the course of the pandemic is countries' adherence to the ICAO um, CART or the Council uh, Recovery Task Force. And what I'm pleased to say is that many of the countries, not only in the, the Middle East, but the Gulf, are 100% aligned with the recommendations set out by ICAO and as reported by ICAO. So we're seeing tremendous adoption of um, uh, public health measures, best practices, as well as uh, safety standards to uh, adhere to the CART recommendations. Just as a, as a broad ex example, one of the things that we track within um, the AME region is the degree to which what we call leaderboard states are uh, how they're performing in relation to other countries in the region. And specifically for the Gulf region, if we look at Qatar and the United Arab Emirates, we see that they have opened up their borders. They are flying to uh, a great number of destinations. So in the case of Qatar Airways, it's almost 100 destinations that they're flying to, which is roughly 75% of their pre-COVID network. So that shows you that in a very short time span, Qatar Airways has built up its, its network. And similarly, in the United Arab Emirates, uh, both the national carriers, whether it's Emirates, Fly Dubai, uh, Etihad Airways, as well as, <coughs> excuse me, Air Arabia, have, have spent the last couple of months really building up to the net, building their network up to where it was uh, earlier on in 2019. But also, there are some roadblocks for the aviation industry, primarily because a lot of the Gulf uh, airlines rely on a transfer product model. So given that some of their larger source countries, such as the Indian subcontinent and the EU, still remain unavailable for the mass uh, population or travelers, that's having a, uh, let's say, an effect on the recovery of, of, of traffic. So we firmly believe that once India opens up and the EU liberalizes their border regimes, the traffic or weekly flight movements will increase significantly. And similarly for the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, um, it has announced a gradual opening up of <coughs> traffic to and from the kingdom, uh, first by allowing GCC citizens and residents, followed by international religious traffic, which started a couple of days ago. So we still see that there is room for growth for restoring traffic to uh, the kingdom. But it's when Saudi citizens will be able to travel in early 2021, where we'll see some meaningful recovery for 
air traffic in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Just as a broad overview for the Middle East region, traffic is still significantly down uh, overall. And what we are forecasting is that full year passenger numbers for 2020 are going to be roughly 30% of what they were for 2019. And if I put that in perspective, that's approximately 60 million people will travel in 2020 compared to the 203 million people that traveled in 2019. So we still see a major difference from where we were last year and the expected uh, number this year. And unfortunately, due to the pandemic and the loss of aviation activity, it's having a knock-on effect, not only on jobs within the aviation industry, but also the associated industries such as tourism, hospitality, and associated sectors, which represents approximately $105 billion loss in the Middle Eastern uh, region GDP, uh, unfortunately. And with that, I'd like to thank Pata for giving me the opportunity to present. And if any of the audience is interested in further updates or information uh, from IATA on border control measures, testing, quarantine policies in the region, please feel free to visit the links mentioned on the slide. Thank you. So, Well, thank you very much, Kashif. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Mario Hardy. And Kashif, please come back for uh, an interview with, uh, with Mario. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Kashif, uh, nice to meet you again. And um, just like to expand and have a little conversation about some of the things that, uh, that you've mentioned in your presentation. And I'm sure many of the people from the audience also have a lot of questions about the future of aviation, considering the current situation. Um, you know, in my lifetime in, in this industry, and I'm sure the same for you, we've never really seen or experienced anything like this before. Uh, I've been to many other types of crises in the aviation sector. I've worked in aviation before, uh, but they normally actually were at a short time span and at a fixed, uh, kind of a fixed period of time where this was impacted. This has been extended over a year and potentially years before we fully recovered from where we are. I believe that, uh, Pretty much all international associations and organizations are in agreement that we will not see a full recovery uh, to the same level of growth we have pre-COVID until either 2023 or 2024, possibly even beyond uh, that stage uh, for, for the industry. And one sector which is specifically has been impacted uh, severely is, is the aviation sector or the airline more specifically. Um, we all know that actually airlines were cash trapped even before COVID for many of them. Um, and in this situation, obviously, has aggravated um, this situation even more. So how, how did the airline in the Gulf adapt, if, if they have adapted to this situation for, for the time being, uh, to, to survive? Uh, thank you, Dr. Mario. So, I mean, the Gulf airlines are, are no different from airlines in Europe or uh, North America. Ultimately, they have sa the same operational challenges uh, from the fallout of COVID-19, even though most of the airlines that we have in the region are either directly owned by governments or government holding entities. Uh, it was easier, I would say, for some of them to get the necessary support very quickly uh, from the governments in terms of financial relief, in terms of tax breaks as well as uh, uh, relief from charges, as well as government administered fees, specifically in the Gulf region. I mean, the airlines are an extension of the government, which was a bit of a double-edged sword for, for them in previous years. But I think one of the advantages um, uh, that their ownership had was that throughout the pandemic, the governments provided them with liquidity, tremendous support in terms of financial and uh, regulatory relief, but also uh, helping them uh, restore their network and liberalizing policies within the government, such as the visa and, and tourism policy to help shore up uh, traffic in the region. And as I mentioned, unfortunately for the Middle East region, um, traffic in, in 2020 is only going to be 30% of what it was in 2019. And that relates to an approximately, you know, 60 million passengers in this year compared with uh, 203 million last year. And what that means is, the longer the, the pandemic stretches, the road to recovery becomes longer. 
just in July, we were saying that we're probably going to have 45% of traffic compared to 2019 levels. And just in September, we had to revise it down to 30%. So you can see just those couple of months of lockdowns and closures had a tremendous effect on the industry. And you're absolutely right. Uh, in terms of the Middle East and the Gulf region, it's no different. We're forecasting a return to 2019 levels, perhaps towards the end of 2024, unfortunately. Do you think this actually situation will lead to consolidation of, of airlines within the region? Um, from an IATA perspective, it's something that we've, we've looked at and tracked. I think there will be a little bit of, there, currently the airlines are focused on creating efficiencies um, and supporting their shareholders with um, the strategy that is set in place. I personally think given the dynamics of the Gulf region and the shareholding structure of the airlines, it's a little difficult to say whether we'll see consolidation, but perhaps for some of the airline groups that have uh, uh, shared ownership, such as Emirates and Fly Dubai, we'll probably see a lot more integration and cooperation, more code shares amongst the network, as well as more cooperation on the procurement, joint efficiencies and looking at operations. But a full consolidation of two different carriers within the region is a little bit difficult, in my opinion. And another question I have for you is that have you, have you seen new business models being actually developed during this crisis in the Gulf? And I'll give you an example where I, I was reading recently that uh, Lufthansa uh, just made a significant investment into an air taxi company called Volocopter, which is essentially driverless drones that will fly people in short distance within half an hour. Um, have you seen business models or interest in airlines in investing in maybe different types of services to, to, for, for the future to be more, to essentially become more resilient? Sure, absolutely. So one of the advantages historically the Gulf carriers had was given that their ownership was government owned, they had a lot of subsidiaries as well as investments into hospitality business, such as hotels and entertainment, which obviously was also impacted. But many of the airlines in the region started branching out and looking at new business models and innovating using their existing asset base. So for example, um, Emirates Flight Catering started looking at the uh, catering business within uh, the UAE, as opposed to just providing flight catering for Emirates aircrafts. In addition to that, many of the airlines have tapped into the domestic leisure market and looked at uh, not only selling or bundling local holiday packages for domestic uh, travel and tourism, uh, as opposed to the international traffic that they had previously. And many of the airlines also in the region have taken advantage of the public health measures that the governments have brought in, whether it's uh, testing or uh, PCR rapid testing, and offering that not only to passengers, but also the general population on their premises as well. And this is a question, or the next question is something I've been asked multiple times already over the last couple of months. When people think of you know, flying pre-COVID-19, we, we, we were extremely fortunate that essentially there were so many direct flights, direct services, point-to-point -point destinations around the world uh, to, for us to fly, maximizing our holidays and our time abroad, uh, as opposed to spending time traveling to the destinations. And so the question is really about, you know, post-COVID or even in the next few years to come, as you said, we're not going to see the full recovery till potentially 2024. Do you think that actually these routes will come back or will there be more uh, transfer points as we had before or more flights will need to be actually connected? Yeah, I mean, in, in the region, historically, the Gulf region has, has done a great job of, you know, following the hub and spoke model of you know, transferring passengers through, uh, you know, airports such as Dubai, Abu Dhabi, Doha, and ha have been doing that relatively successfully. Uh, with the onslaught of COVID-19, many of them had to think about that model. And, and if we look at, for example, the Gulf carriers, one of their biggest markets still remains largely unserved, which is the Indian subcontinent. Uh, because of the um, lockdowns, but also the limited travel bubbles that the Indian government is putting in place, India was the number one source of traffic into the region, both for OND, but also for transfers, mainly to Europe, the UK, Canada, and North America. So many of the airlines still are hopeful that once, you know, the, the border measures and public health measures are eased, that that traffic will come back. And we're starting to see, you know, 
airlines such as Emirates and, and Qatar Airways restore their network to over 100 destinations. So that's getting them up to a point. But it's not necessarily only passengers. Throughout the pandemic, most of the airlines have focused on the cargo connectivity to transport essential PPE, ventilators, and uh, face masks for, for uh, governments that, that didn't have access to it. And I think now more than ever, besides the passenger segment, airlines are focused on cargo. One of the things we saw early on uh, during the pandemic in March or April was airlines looking at repurposing passenger aircraft for the carriage of cargo. And I think that's another element where airlines have innovated and shown their resilience and flexibility of being able to use passenger uh, aircrafts for the carriage of cargo to essentially provide uh, goods and services. And it only further endorses the essential nature of the aviation industry. I'd like to change topic a little bit and talk about you know, the, the passenger's journey, if you, if you wish, because a lot of questions. You know, we, we see that uh, many destinations and countries around the world are, uh, have implementing their own protocols. There, as you said before in your presentation, some countries ask you to do a test uh, 120 hours before, some are three days before, some are longer, some are shorter, some you do an arrival, some are both. Um, and, uh, and, and for the audience here who are mostly travel agencies and interpreters, planning trips for people or even for travelers, this is getting really confusing uh, to figure out what I need to do if I travel to one destination as opposed to another one. What am I required? What type of test? Who is going to test? Where I'm going to test? When I need to test? Do I need a health certificate or a common pass, health passport, and et cetera? Do you, do you see a future where there will be some type of normalization of these protocols that will help and facilitate travel? And it has to, and it has to be. I mean, from, from IATA, I mean, you know, standardizing processes is, is something that we certainly hope uh, happens in the industry. Um, as, as the onslaught of COVID-19, uh, you know, happened or took place, many governments didn't really have the expedience of dealing with the, the uh, pandemic. And then there was no protocol per se of safely restarting aviation. I, I personally think, you know, organizations such as ICAO as well as IATA and, and ACI have done, a, have done a tremendous job in trying to harmonize and advocate for, uh, you know, simple, effective and common practices around the world. But what we've seen is that most of the governments, it's not necessarily the travel, agency, travel agencies, airports, airlines or civil aviation authorities that are in the driving seat. It's the public health authorities. It's the National Health Council or the ministries of health that are dictating what the protocols need to be. And those unfortunately vary from state to state or country to country. And this is why we have a patchwork of global protocols, whereas one country you could get a PCR test done on arrival, others might require you to double test. And unfortunately, a disturbing trend we're seeing is countries that are requiring three tests for travelers. And all that does is it creates ambiguity for the traveling public uh, especially if you're traveling uh, with family. As it is, there's a lot of confusion with imminent lockdowns around the world as well as the threat of COVID. But if I have to factor in different visa and border policies, uh, quarantine programs, or testing, that creates for you know four or five different steps that I need to evaluate before undertaking a journey. And all that really does is, A, it deters people from taking those short trips and only... Uh, the people that need essential trips will travel. But again, there's tremendous confusion and ambiguity, which needs to be cleared. And one of the things that IATA we've been working on is A, having a single repository of travel information, which we've been able to do using the IATA Travel Center, which lists uh, worldwide by country, the entry requirements, the visa policy, as well as public health measures to help the traveling public, as well as the industry understand what are the requirements for you to enter borders. I, I suspect, and I think, you know, we, we had this conversation with some of your colleagues too, that for, for sadly, for an, experience, uh, uh, an extended period of time, we will live in, a, uh, in moments of uncertainty and also with different protocols, as you explained, uh, for, for quite some time. But let me rephrase the question in a different way. If, what is either IFA's recommendation or uh, suggestion for an effective way of uh, moving forward in terms of the protocols. What are your recommendations to the industry? 
So our recommendations to the industry are that A, we would like governments and stakeholders to safely restore aviation. And what we mean by safely is following the recommendations the, in the ICAO CART program, as well as the IATA and ACI joint biosafety program. But more importantly, using testing as a means to open up aviation rather than administering quarantine or fragmented policies. We know that the risk of infection for uh, onboard aircrafts is, is next to low or extremely negligible. We know that there is demand for passengers to travel across borders. Uh, we've had borders and, and travel suspended for, for many countries since the end of March up until recently. So there is that pent up demand, shall we say. So the IATA mantra or the recommendation that we have is to have an effect effective testing mechanism put in place to safely restore uh, aviation, whether it's through PCR or looking at newer uh, evolving modes of testing, such as rapid antigen testing, can ho hopefully safely open up aviation. And then, so uh, as, we, as we get to near the conclusion, I, I'd like to also ask a question about the, the airport journey. So what a, one of the questions I've also get asked quite often is, what would travel look like post COVID-19? Are the protocols that we're putting in place today, will they stay till post-COVID-19? And will our travel, traveler's journey be different when we go to an airport or transit somewhere or even at a destination? Oh, by all means. Unfortunately, one of the things that we've seen is that as a result of the onslaught of COVID-19, the airport passenger experience has changed significantly. So we are going to see perhaps temporary measures at least until a vaccine uh, is found or uh, there is some other alternative to the pandemic, that passengers, A, first and foremost, will need to continue to physically distance at an airport, which puts tremendous strain on the airport infrastructure, especially those airports that were already capacity constrained and limited in their footprint. But more and more uh, airports also have to adhere to local health guidelines. So the temperature screening of passengers, the segregation or the physical distancing, the use of contactless solutions as opposed to the physical interaction of passengers as well as airport uh, check-in agents, uh, bag handling uh, agents, as well as immigration and security. So one of you know, the key trends that we're noticing is that many airports are fast tracking their contactless or biometric journeys to, to be able to offer passengers that uh, contactless solution so that A, not only is their journey secure, but also they're able to do it without any uh, interaction with uh, um, staff at the airport. But more importantly for the airports themselves, it's, it's having you know, uh, challenges on the infrastructure, the, the available space, processing time. I mean, if you're a airline check-in agent or a ground handler, imagine the time that you need to spend now per passenger just verifying whether their passport is valid, whether their entry uh, requirements are valid, checking whether they have a PCR negative test. And certain countries also require uh, gate agents to check whether any passenger has been in a country with a high uh, COVID-19 uh, you know, risk base, such as China and others in, in the early days. So you have various checks that you need to do per passenger, which is driving up the processing time, unfortunately. And then another element is the additional disinfection, sanitation, and, and uh, cleaning protocols that both the airports and passengers need to adhere to and spend time on. And the use of personal protective equipment, which is obviously all of these measures coupled together will have an effect on the operations cost, but also the processing time and the overall passenger experience. Good. Uh, and just one last question I'd like to ask, just because you made me think about it. We talked about the vaccine a little bit, and I know that uh, there were comments made by your, uh, your director general and also by ACI recently about the requirements for the distribution of the vaccine, uh, which covers your cargo area in terms of the distribution of it, the complexity of, of uh, the distribution of the vaccine. Can you expand on that just a little bit more? Sure. So one of the things that we've done at IATA have... have has been to look at the challenges or the logistical, uh, uh, shall we say, the challenge of distributing a COVID-19 uh, vaccine uh, when it is officially available and endorsed by uh, organizations such as the World Health Organizations and others. So the logistical challenge of, of getting those vaccines to um, countries all around the world presents not only a challenge to airlines, but also cargo operators as well. We saw 
you know, in the early days of COVID-19, the logistical challenges of getting PPE and ventilators to far parts of the world. And one of the estimates that IATA had, just to put things into perspective, was it would take approximately 8,000 plus 747 or wide-bodied aircrafts to manage just the first phase of the vaccine distribution across the world. But also uh, having the, uh, let's say, the integrated infrastructure as well as intermodal nodes of cargo um, hubs, the airlines, the distribution channels is going to be a challenge for not only the aviation industry, but others. And, and one of the things that we've done at IATA is partnering with the likes of the World Health Organization, uh, various different UN agencies such as UNICEF and the World Food Program to look at various mechanisms of safely distributing the vaccine, but also creating the awareness within the industry for airlines, airports, and uh, freight forwarders on the, um, let's say, the handling requirements of pharmaceutical products, cold chain pharmaceutical in particular. And what we firmly believe is that many airports are well positioned to take advantage of, uh, you know, their geographical proximity to major source markets, such as uh, Doha and Qatar, as well as Dubai. Emirates Airlines has already uh, initiated a project in the UAE to create a dedicated logistics and distribution center at the Dubai World Central, which is a secondary airport in uh, the UAE, to be able to take uh, advantage of not only the Emirates network, but a dedicated cargo facility with cold chain uh, facilities to be able to distribute uh, pharmaceutical uh, products and vaccines to over a 4 billion population, which lives within a four hour flying radius from Dubai. So that's one of the examples of what a regional stakeholder is doing. Good, thank you very much. Um, any, any last words in, in concluding, maybe some, some positivity, if there's anything, any, any signs of hope for us moving forward? So what we're, what we're seeing, uh, you know, in terms of positive news, we do know the challenges that the industry has and what it would take to safely restore aviation. One of the things that we're looking forward to in IATA is the uh, additional, uh, let's say, parts to the ICAO CART program, which are due in the next couple of weeks. We firmly believe that governments understand the importance aviation, tourism, and hospitality have to the industry. We do realize that many of the governments uh, now know that the, the pandemic is here to stay, so they need to open up borders, they need to let people travel and business activity to continue with the health protocols in place. And we're starting to see traffic recover uh, a little bit. So in the Middle East and the Gulf region, I'm, I'm hopeful and our forecast indicate that we'll have approximately 45% of 2019 levels next year. So that's something to look forward to. And hopefully with the opening up of major source markets, we'll get that number even higher. And uh, yeah, that's, that's uh, my, my words of uh, hope to end on. Good. Thank you very much. It's been a great pleasure to have you with us today, Kashish. And, um, My pleasure, Dr. With, Mario. And on behalf of IATA, I'd like to thank the Pacific Asia Travel Association for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Paul, Paul back over to you. Thank you, Mario. Thank you, Kashif. Uh, yeah, it was a great presentation and, and great interview. You know, it's funny because there was uh, some that me and Mario had talked about earlier regarding the importance of uh, the... the talking to it with the health authorities as they seem to be more controlling um, how things are, will be moving forward, particularly as it relates to travel and tourism. And with that, that is the end of today's session. If you have any questions regarding anything you heard today, feel free to reach out to myself. My email is paul at pata.org. Uh, you can also find more information about Pata and the activities that we do. Um, at our website, www.pata.org. And with that, I would like to once again thank Dr. Mario Hardy and uh, Mr. Sheaf, um, and thank you all for joining us and for this session. Thank you and have a good day.